It's an amazing uh, privilege to have Ruben Morgan with us. Uh, Ruben. <laughs> Ruben is uh, the worship pastor of Hillsong in London. He spent many years at Hillsong in Sydney. I mean, I could spend the rest of the service just going through the songs he's written. Mighty to Save, This Is Our God, Cornerstone. Uh, unbelievable songs that have blessed the church. Um, so for the next 25, 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to just interview Ruben and also uh, Matt, who's just led us wonderfully in worship. Uh, so can we give a huge welcome to Ruben Morgan and Matt Redman. Come and uh, grab a seat here, Ruben. This should be a microphone coming your way. So Ruben, um, just quickly uh, catch us up to speed. So you, well these are moving. <laughs> I feel like I'm all on a waterbed. Um, no, not that I've been on a waterbed, but anyway. Um, actually my parents-in-law used to have a waterbed, but that's, uh, this is getting out of hand, isn't it? Um, anyway, <laughs> Ruben, back to you. Um, just fill us up to speed. You, you've uh, been in Sydney for leading worship at Hillsong for how many years? Um, well, I've been in Sydney uh, at Hillsong Church for 18 years, so probably leading worship maybe 16 of those. Well, and then about 18 months ago, you moved to London. Right. Just talk us through that move. How did that come so up? So massive, kind of massive change, obviously. I've got uh, three kids. One of them is here. Ezra is down there, my uh, six-year-old. He's hanging out, worshipping with you guys. No, actually, he's playing games on the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> It's a form of worship. It is. <laughs> it's his, it's his style. He's got his own. Um, so we moved our family 18 months ago, and it's like obviously the biggest thing we've ever done. Um, but, you know, we, we'd been coming here for years, you know, coming to London, but also sort of through Europe and uh, ministering here, leading worship and, and doing other things. And um, me and my wife just really felt like there was something here for us. You know, every time we came, we're like... Uh, there was a stirring in us that felt like somewhere in the future, this, this is us, you know, and we didn't know when. And every time we come here, we'd be like, you know, you, you know that pull inside your heart. It's like, man, there's, there's something here. So uh, there was a few times over the years that we were like, is this the right time? We never said anything to anybody, but always, you know, kind of put it off. It wasn't the right time. And really, it's like a couple of years ago, it was just like something kind of clicked and it was right. You're never exactly sure, but I, I spoke to, um, you know, begun the conversation with uh, my senior pastor, Brian Houston. And uh, we talked about it, and it was just like, it was the right time. And uh, we're just honored to be part of what's happening here. This is an absolute miracle, what's happening here. I think it's incredible. I'm just honored to be with you and, and uh, part of this, and part of what God's doing in Europe and in this part of the world. Amazing. And Ruben, how did you begin leading worship? And talk about something of your journey of getting involved. Um, well, I mean, I sort of started leading worship kind of with a bit of probably like everybody, fear and trembling, you know. And uh, like I'd begun writing songs and we'd started writing, uh, singing the songs in church, um, which was first a big shock to me, you know. And then because I think that I was writing these songs, uh, you know, Darlene Check and uh, my pastor kind of just pushed me out the front to lead them, you know, and see, see if I could kind of carry that, which I didn't very well for a good while. And then, you, you know, as we went, um, just, it, it's amazing to have people believe in you, isn't it? You, you need, you, all you need is one person that's like, you can do it, um, keep going, you know, even if you feel like you're rubbish at it, that there's somebody believing in you. And, and the, you know, probably one of the greatest blessings in my life is that somebody believed in me enough to kind of see the potential and to tell me to keep going, and, and um, so that's kind of what happened. It's brilliant. Now, I know all of us here have been hugely impacted by what God has done through Hillsong, and uh, the songs, and the, the ministry. You know, every time I refresh my Twitter, there's another huge conference happening, you know, some country in the world. It's just, it's phenomenal what God has done, and, and the impact. And also, I think lots of people see the kind of, uh, yeah, just the amazing numbers and the production and the excellence that you guys have pursued and it's been amazing. But perhaps sometimes don't always get to see something of the values. You know, that the years that kind of, of developing a culture at Hillsong. Yeah. It'd be great just to hear something of what you see, what kind of makes Hillsong unique. What are the key values 
that you're passionate about? Well, I, I'm not sure we're too dissimilar to what you're doing in that um, ultimately we want people to connect with Christ, you know, and that's, that's the bottom line. That's really what we're after. And um, style can change. Um, any of this can change, come and go. But really what we want is, you know, the songs can change, whatever. It's just that we want people to connect with Christ. We want people to have an encounter with God that's real and that's lasting, that makes a lasting change. So, you know, in worship, that's what we're going for. It's what we're going for with the songs. It's what we're going for with the worship services. And it's what we're going for with our team as well. Um, and really, everything else is negotiable. It's just the message is the thing, you know, which I'm sure is what it's like here. Um, and so we have seen that change over the years, you know, Another thing is, you know, there is a, the, in our teams, there's a strong kind of culture of, you know, we're here to serve, we're not here to be Mr. Somebody leading worship or in front of the lights or on Twitter or whatever. We are, we're here to serve. And really, it doesn't get any bigger than that. It doesn't get any smaller than that, you know. And um, serve the Lord with gladness is kind of the deal. I mean, that's always the thing I've noticed. But how do you kind of encourage that in your teams, that serving hearted? kind of serving with gladness <laughs> well I don't know I mean I think if you have an expectation people gen generally rise to it or they don't and um, I found it if you have an expectation up here people are pretty good at kind of lifting their game or like doing something else you know but people people do rise to your expectation I found that I've done the same when people have expected high things of me that I've been able to kind of reach for that. And that's what we all want. We want, want to be better than we can become on our own. And, um, and I also think no matter what you say, it's what you are, it's what you be that creates the culture. And um, we are the culture and we set the culture of our teams. So how does your teams work? I mean, I know you've got multiple services, but say, for example, in London, um, be interesting just to hear because one of the questions we're always thinking about how do we get new people on board how we, do we train them up keep the quality but also keep growing it how do you guys do that in london well we're uh, we're reassessing a lot of things you know uh, uh, we me and my wife sarah we've kind of just taken on the team and we're kind of on a journey so we're starting to do new things and we're stopping doing some of the things we've been doing and we're kind of working out what's going to work here in london and here in the uk um but the main thing is, is that people connect with like-minded people and that people can get on the journey. Uh, so our teams are about that, gathering people and connecting people into a connect group, we call them, you know, where they can, you know, do Bible studies or whatever, but like do the journey together, be accountable and do life. Because um, London's a big place and it can be a lonely place for a lot of people and we want to be that connection point for people, like-minded people connecting. Um, and then, you, you know, uh, training is a big thing, so upskilling people wherever they're at, whatever they're gifting, whatever their skill is, um, helping them wherever they are go to another level and get better. We want to do that. And, and would you do that in large groups or would it be more one to one? Yeah, so we break it down. You, I mean, not so much one to one. If we're doing, we'll do like a guitar workshop or whatever, and someone will kind of, you, you know, talk about the sounds, you, you know, what guitarists do, all the pedals, and talk about what we do in these songs and kind of teach our players, we do things like that. So we break it down. Uh, and the other thing is we're, we, we just want people to be inspired for Christ and, and um, keep stepping up that way. So Amazing. And um, you've obviously been leading worship for many years. For you, um, what are you thinking about when you're leading worship? That know. you can share. No, but I, I, I mean, by that, I mean, you know, what, what are you hoping will happen? What is the kind of goal, the vision? How, how do you prepare? What is sort of, what, what leads to the end of the worship when you come away and think, great, that was a real was good a, time? Yeah. What made it a win? Yeah. Um, well, you're going for God, aren't you? I mean, uh, with everything you're using, all the elements that you have at your disposable, disposal to point people to Christ, you know, and... And, and so I think a lot about the song list and the songs because if the songs are strong, it really helps uh, everything else. And if they're not, it doesn't matter what you say, you're just working really hard. Um, so the songs have to be right and, you know, take people on a journey. And then you just got to make sure nothing gets in the way, nothing's distracting. 
uh, the more lights you have, the more skill you actually have to have um, as with an operator, you know, because otherwise it gets in the way and it's distracting. Um, sometimes less is more, you know, and, and same with the arrangements, all of those sort of things, making sure that everything points and doesn't take away from just getting people's eyes focused on Christ and people experiencing God's presence. Brilliant. Um, Matt, it's great to have, have you here. Um, again, how many years have you been leading worship now? Um, 25. Wow, amazing. So old. <laughs> and, Can't uh, be possible. Yeah. How... Um, have you kept passionate about leading and what is it that kind of gets you out of bed thinks wow this is amazing i get to do this um for me it's the same answer connecting people with christ but i I notice how much the songs can do that so that that's one thing that really um i get out of bed i'm hungry to to because i've seen songs dramatically shape or invade someone's life um, bring hope in the darkest moment for me that's the thing that really gets me going um, I mean that last song we sung now um, 10,000 Reasons I, uh, I wrote that with a gu- Swedish guy called Jonas Myron who's a friend of all ours and, and um, is a Swedish person here fantastic <laughs> excellent um, <coughs> yeah. and uh, it's we've had six emails now from people who um as they were dying in hospital uh, of terminal cancer, actually, they asked, can I be having that song played as pass away to be with Jesus? And the last one, they had said they had a 31 people in the room and they were singing over this person. And that kind of thing, to me, is like... Well, I'm trying to think a lot about... Um, actually, Louis Giglio spoke at the HTB Focus Conference in the summer about the immeasurably more... and. For me, I, I want more stories where you can't put a figure or a number on it. You can't really measure it. They're ones for me. You can say, oh, how many people showed up to a conference? Or you can say, uh, how many people were there on a Sunday morning service? Or, you know, how many times you live worship that month? All that kind of thing at church. But I love the stories where you can't really put a, a figure on them. You can't measure them. This, they're off the charts, you know. And, um, and it would be good to talk to you both about songwriting. But, uh, Matt, I know you, over the years, there's been a real profound theme about meeting God through pain, you know, think about blessed be your name, never let go even the 10,000 reasons you say in that kind of worshipping in those final moments um, yeah, can you talk about why you think those themes are so important and how worship and perhaps some of those struggles come together yeah, definitely, I mean, I guess it's something we've talked about for quite a few years, and I think um you know, there's a lot of colours that you have to have in the worship spectrum. One of them is joy, you know, and one of the things with that is there's not a lot of joy to mirror in our culture, you know. So if you're going to write a, a joyful song musically, you haven't got all that many kind of things you can uh, relate to in, in mainstream culture, you know. So that's an interesting challenge. But the other one is that other side of, yeah, like pain and struggle. And I guess the reason that I write about that is firstly because that's where the songs came out of they weren't I don't think I sat down and thought right I need another song that's going to help people trust God in a dark moment blessed be your name never let go they all came out of that really um, but I I wanted to write them because I thought number one it's biblical you know Eugene Peterson reckons that 70% of the content of the Psalms is lament and then number two um, it's relevant like there's no one in this earth escapes pain and suffering and confusion and and um, and I think actually there might be a third reason I think it might be a, a great window actually onto the heart of God for someone who doesn't know him you know I think there's like oh there's room for me oh there's I'm not ruled out because I'm going through this oh you actually care about that I don't have to check that at the door I can bring that with me you know and, and that so I think there's some great reasons to, to write about those themes definitely and in, in terms of um songwriting process I mean again it'd be great a song like 10,000 Reasons how did that come about? Um, we were in a, a, writing in a little chapel me and, and the Swede man and uh, we were uh, did you say sweet man or a Swede man 
By the way, you were saying earlier, seventhly, eighthly. I don't know if that's real English, but it might be. But I was like, hundredthly, hundred and onethly, hundred and toothly. In in Wales, in Wales, in Wales. where my roots are, that yeah. is actually uh, it's, Wales, it's yeah. a bit of Welsh. This is a bit of a Welsh thing because Morgan is a Welsh name, I think. And you've as got in Welsh blood, Glam Morgan, you? and I'm half Welsh. Exactly. You're fully Welsh, <laughs> Timothy Llewellyn Hughes, the clues in the name. Um, but what I was thinking is uh, this stage, apparently in 1966, the year that we hosted the World Cup, England hosted the World Cup, um, England, um, <laughs> they, apparently uh, some, this is the, it was held here, it was on display here and someone stole it. You remember that, that yeah. story about the World Cup being, well I don't remember, I'm not that old, but... Um, that, that happened here and so I, I wondered if like Australia or Wales have ever been to the World Cup have they? I don't know. Um, and what was the question? <laughs> uh, it was about um, songwriting about yeah 10, that song 10,000 reasons so uh, we were in uh, this little chapel and Jonas he has a lot of melody ideas and he had a little, a little bit of chorus Melody. He kept saying, can, can I play this song? And I said to him like three occasions, no joke, mate, we've got so many other songs going. Let's just be disciplined and look at those. And I just haven't got any mind space for this. He's not really a pushy person, is he? So the fourth time he said to me, hey, can, can I show you this thing? I thought, oh, bless his little heart, but humor him. <laughs> and, uh, and as soon as he, he played it, we, we were just all over it. Something came. I think, uh, I think some... I don't think there's any reason why some songs come fast. Some take a long time and a lot of hard work. This one came really fast, but then Blessed Be Your Name probably took me longer than any other song. I think, uh, I don't think it's more inspired or more holy that it came fast, but this one was a blessing it did. And, and um, it was, yeah, it was a nice little moment. Amazing, yeah. And, and Ruben, take a song like Mighty to Save, which you wrote with... Uh, Ben Fielding. How did that, was that one of the same kind of quickly no, uh, came about in a chapel? <laughs> we actually wrote that in the summer in, uh, at my house and uh, it was kind of hard going all the way really uh, and it, the chorus was sort of the first thing, you know, that kind of idea, saviour, you can move the mountain and kind of just kept singing mighty to save, he's mighty to save, which um, I wanted to take out of the song and thankfully Ben kind of pressured me to keep it there and uh, it, it was just one of those things every section we just labored and labored over because we just wanted to get it right and you know it's one of those things I'm, I'm sh sure you think this way too you want it to be easy for a worship leader to do it so when you when you sing the song in church it's not hard it's not one of those songs that you need a good atmosphere for it to go well it's one of those songs that when the atmosphere is absolutely dead as a worship leader, you go, okay, what do I need? I need 10,000 reasons because yeah. everyone's going to just love that anyway and people, people will enter in. So you, we just wanted to make it possible. You know, there's some songs that just make it possible for people to worship and it's kind of the prayer anyway. And so how did you know it was finished? Because I've got a few little thoughts about... Um... <laughs> Third verse. Really? <laughs> I'm open to it. Now, how, how, I think it's, uh, Chris and I get asked all the time, how do you know when a song is finished? How did you know, right, I think we've tinkered enough, let's l use it. Well, I don't, I, <laughs> I didn't, and I know we spent a lot of time on the, the bridge as well, you know, kind of laboring over that, but you sort of feel like, okay, that is, that's great. And then I showed it to a couple of people and they were, like I showed it to Joel Houston and, and Marty Sampson at the same time, and they were um, quite, uh, they were into it. So, I mean, that's always good. And um, But then I, we kind of give the songs to our sort of theologian in the church and he looks over everything and there was a line I, I think it was um, everyone needs compassion and the, the next line was needs more than religion and I was attached to that line but he was just like it's not going to fly you know and but it was you know it's just one of those lines you love need more we need more than religion but I'm thankful that we changed it because I think it would have He's just like, it's going to limit the song. So. Yeah, it's great. And um, I know uh, you're really intentional, actually, both of you, about songwriting and how you, 
use your time to write. So, you know, maybe start with Ruben, you've got kids, leading worship, pressures, you're traveling. How do you keep that a real focus and priority? Uh, well, I, I think the main thing is just getting going on it, starting something, you know. And um, that's really the challenge, finding a time, <coughs> like booking it in the diary, booking in a co-write, um, making it a priority in your event planning. And um, so that's been the thing. And, and different seasons kind of require a different approach. It was much easier for me to write all night when I wasn't married and kind of go walking late at night in the streets, just kind of sing and, you know, think and pray and write that way. But when I got married, that had to change. And, um, <laughs> and it, <laughs> she told you, what week did she tell you that in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite happy to stay at home, actually. So. And, and, um, you dra dragged it right down now. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But, uh, but you, you know, you work at, at, it. Actually, took me a little while. To, I'm sorry. It actually took me. A, actually, took me a little while to uh, to work out how to change that, and it more became a routine or a, a discipline. You know, it's going to happen at 10 o'clock in the morning, which seemed just completely an ungodly time to write. But you get used to it. Though. And Matt, for you. Um, writing for years you must have gone through seasons where you don't wake up feeling like songs are kind of buzzing um how have you kind of worked or dealt with writer's block those struggles i think for me some of it has been um that even even when i'm not don't have something really like hugely bubbling away in my heart i have a little file of past ideas that open up and it's so often it's interesting how that kick starts something uh, you know, it takes me back, oh yeah, I remember, I wrote that down, and oh yeah, there's that theme, oh yeah, I'd love to sing about that. And So for me, that's, I have a little file that's kind of like a little Kickstarter, but the other thing that kickstarts it hugely is collaboration. I know we've, already, we've all song wrote together, and I just find so often when I don't have something, the other person does. I think that's probably how it works in pretty much all of the kingdom of God. You know, that's the team thing, isn't it? And I think um, I'm writing more songs now that I've really aggressively team writing um, the other thing I was wanting to sort of ask you guys about I mean Matt's been an amazing year for you Grammys Doves just huge encouragements songs kicking off um, and we often you know we talk about meeting God in the kind of challenges but what have you been experiencing in terms of meeting God in those blessings and encouragements what have you been kind of learning about his heart that's a great question I think um, well, there's two things I'd say one is um, I was reading about mountaineering recently as you do and uh, they were talking about there's a, a level you can get to altitude wise where you have to remember to breathe there's some physiological things that change at that altitude and I thought man that's a good lesson for all of us worship leaders when something's going great in a moment of joy or success, remember to breathe. You're, you know, uh, you might be seeing things you've never seen before because you're, you know, remember to breathe. And, and um, that's 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 been a good thought um, for me. And the other thing I'd say, which I've heard a lot of preachers speak on now, is this whole thing of battle and blessing. And I think so often uh, we wrote a song like it recently, but um, battle and blessing seem to run alongside each other so often. Sometimes when s some stuff's going really good and there's a lot of encouragement and excitement around something there's there is definitely a you know a sense of being opposed and, and we've had quite a lot of that this year i think and but in it all i really know i've known the goodness of god and and it's it's it you know i'm a few years older than you and it just never ceases to amaze me how uh, how constant god's goodness is it's just it's utterly constant isn't it and um I guess maybe similar for, for you, Ruben, with the responsibilities of looking after a worship team and particularly, you know, you with a level of profile. But I think it's, it connects all of us, all leaders, we're all influencing and responsible for people. What, what do you do to maybe keep yourself accountable or how do you um, keep working on your spirituality? You know, that kind of self-leadership stuff. How do you keep yourself sharp? Um, well, you have to, don't you? Uh, and and 
<coughs> I think habits can be good there um, to kind of keep you on track and and I think it's a challenge you to keep your prayer life alive keep the you know the the spiritual disciplines I don't we, you, you don't hear at least in our circles we don't talk a lot about the spiritual disciplines but they're so good for keeping us um, kind of well you know watered on the inside and and um, no matter what the time, you know, the highs and the lows, and like Matt was saying, they do come together, I think. Um, and sometimes I think that's a good thing. Uh, but to keep, you know, focused on Christ, and keep in the Word, and keep learning it, memorizing it, and keep the, the, the stuff alive that keeps us sensitive and, and, and focused on God and, and open to the Holy Spirit. And it's, no doubt it's a challenge, and, you, you know, we have seasons uh, where we do it better than others. But. And just to press you a bit on the, so the spiritual disciplines, or uh, what, maybe what does that look like for you? Uh, <laughs> Without putting you on the spot, but I think I always find it so encouraging just to hear how other people connect with God because we're always learning. You know what? I found that, uh, like, learning the Bible, you know, learning scripture, and you probably do a lot of it, but uh, <laughs> like doing some of those things is good, you know, and. Um, the more you read some of the, um, the great leaders of, you know, is that that's one of the, the disciplines that has just set them up in life. It's just learning the Bible, learning big passages, learning Psalms and having them kind of echo in your mind all the time and really, you know, grilling that down. Cause it just brings light, doesn't it? Final question for you, Matt, and then one more for Ruben. Um, you've been traveling around, leading worship. Um, what are you seeing that really excites you at the moment? I think one of the things, um, it's not necessarily a new thing, but I think it's definitely been turned up in the mix, is the whole social justice thing in the church. I mean, privileged to work with Passion Movement in America, and they, they gather about 60,000 college students, and just this huge heart emerging from there for wanting to to uh, represent the heart of God to the poor and the forgotten and the needy. And it, it's not a new thing. I mean, so many streams of the church here are, have accelerated, I think, in the last 10 years on that. And, but that, that, that just, uh, I think it's amazing. We live in a time where um, so, many of, so much of what we said could be misunderstood or opposed, but so, social justice is fantastic because it's worship you know, firstly, it's, it's also um, justice, but it's also evangelism. And you can't really argue against it. You know, there's, so I just think um, it's really, uh, I've loved seeing that. I mean, even on, we've got this new album out, we've got have a song on there specifically about, it's meant to be congregational, and it's specifically about human trafficking, because I just think God's really turned that up in the mix a lot. And I love that we could, people are doing so much of it now, it'd be great to sing it too. Brilliant. And then, Ruben, for you, um, I don't know, if sort of looking back over sort of your leadership, is there anything you think, gosh, I wish I'd done that differently? And in that, is there one, I guess, key encouragement you'd have for all of us as leaders of worship, musicians, followers of Christ? Wow. Man, Big question to end on. Um, Move to England quicker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I uh, I don't know. I I think you you never want to you never want to waste the opportunity to honor your leaders and honor the people that you have a short season of time serving under or with. And um I mean we all have that, you know, where you you can take a moment for granted like it's going to be forever, but it just it, it isn't and it doesn't stay like that and and um, I would say of anything, you, you could just never honor your leaders enough and pray for them enough. And, and um, we always think that we can do it better and, um, and bigger and whatever than the people that are going before us. But often we don't realize what they're carrying and what they're having to deal with, you know, and what went before them. And so I would say just keep honoring uh, the people that you're serving and serving under. Amazing. So good. Hey, guys, thank you so much. Um, Matt and Ruben, you just um, you give so much to the church. But what I love about these guys is not just they're you know, super gifted, but 
when I, you know, see them with your families, you're the kind of guys I want to become more like and learn from. And I think that's, that's what we're about, isn't it? It's not what we do, it's who we are. And uh, could you maybe, it'd be great, just maybe you could end, maybe Ruben, why don't you pray, particularly perhaps for the songwriters here, because uh, we've seen it throughout this weekend. Amazing songs just release so much, and we want to see more incredible songs being written and uh, sung around the world. So why don't you just pray for, if you're a songwriter, you can put a hand on your heart, just ask that God would uh, anoint you in this. God, I thank you for what you are doing through this ministry, God. And God, I thank you for the lives that have already been changed, God, but that the lives yet to be changed, Father God, and all the potential that is here in this room, God. God, I pray for the songwriters, the worship leaders, the musicians, Father God, every area of creativity, God. God, I pray that you would strengthen them with your power, Father God. I pray that you would inspire them with revelation, Father God, that you would open their hearts, God, to see who you are, Father God. God, I thank you that your promise is fruitfulness, God, and I pray that they would press into you after this weekend more and more, God, that they'll be woken in the night, God, to be close to you, Father God, to get to know you more, God. And God, I thank you for what you have for the church in this part of the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Reuben, Matt, thank you so much.